Hi, everybody. I am Jasmine Shamslau, your host today for It's Not Your Money, real talk about achieving racial equity in philanthropy. Our slightly irreverent but frank conversations feature leaders challenging the status quo of philanthropy today and those who are demonstrating how we can collectively build a more equitable and just funding landscape, particularly for Black, Indigenous, other people of colour, women and non-binary founders. So today I am joined by Morgan Dawson, co-CEO and Beth McCaw, founding funder of Threshold Philanthropy. And we are gonna have a conversation about power, about race, partnership, and throughout all of that, we are gonna be directly owning and addressing our identities as a black leader, a white funder, and also me as a mixed race host too. So our goal is to speak very openly and frankly about the dynamics at play, and also to highlight how those who fund and those who fund raise can have real conversations about race and power in our relationships and in our work. So without further ado, welcome Morgan and Beth. Please, please tell us a bit about yourselves and how you came to work together. Hi everyone, I am Morgan Dawson and I'll do a little bit of a whole description. I am a black, uh, fat, queer woman with shoulder length locks and I'm wearing like a multicolored cardigan and a yellow dress, but you can't really see that. Um, I uh, met Beth at the Washington Women's Foundation. Um, it was the second job I had when I moved to Seattle. I moved to Seattle from Santa Fe, New Mexico because my um, partner was going to grad school at UW. And when I first got to Seattle, I was a nanny. Um, I couldn't really find a job. Seattle is weird in the sense that like people wanted to see Seattle on my resume before they hired me. Um, and so I was nannying and I uh, applied for a part-time office manager position at a community foundation called, or a collective giving foundation. I don't know how they refer to themselves now. Uh, called the Washington Women's Foundation. I could do it while the kids were at school. Um, it wasn't um, the full event experience I wanted, but I could set up and tear down events and make friends that were not um, way older than me with, with kids or tiny humans. <laughs> so that was very exciting. And I, I think it was kind of kismet because when I got to Washington Women's Foundation, Beth was two years in and everyone had been there for around eight years and they ha were all ready to leave. It was most of people's first job out of school and they had stayed there longer than they wanted and they were leaving and it was kind of going to be just me and Beth. And she said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, you guys do all these events, but no one likes doing events <laughs> and they're spread across four people. So I would like to build you an event department. And I, I think, I mean, we appreciate Washington Women's Foundation so much, but those women really took the time to explain philanthropy to me. I, I didn't know what it was. It was odd to me. I was like, this is not <laughs> what black and brown folks do. This is not, I'm mm. used to mutual aid and community care. So I didn't really understand philanthropy and I got a crash course course there. Um, and I got to work with Beth on bringing a foundation that was seen as an ivory tower to a place rooted in community. Mm. Um, yeah, I'll let you, I'll let you fill in some gaps I might've left Beth. Thanks, Morgan. I'm Beth McCaw. I use she, her pronouns. I am identify as white, middle-aged woman with now blonde hair because I turned gray in my 20s, so it's dyed. I'm not natural blonde. It's a what I refer to as a classic white mom bob. I'm wearing a <laughs> blue button-down collared dress this morning, um, and I'm coming to you from Seattle, Washington, which is um, the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. Um, I, my career started as an attorney. I was an estate planning attorney, which I now say I assisted families in hoarding intergenerational wealth, which seems really strange mm. <laughs> to transition from 
you know, working with families and a lot of philanthropic families for 16 years, mm -hmm. I helped families create family foundations, think about their own charitable giving, both during lifetime and upon their death. So I was really steeped in this work as an attorney, even before becoming a professional in the sector when I joined Washington Women's Foundation as its president and CEO. And so um, I also have a master's in not-for-profit leadership, uh, which, mm -hmm. you know, I've actually thought about working deeply in the sector, really on the fundraising side before um, joining the funder side. Um, I've also served on a lot of boards. And so I've been both a fundraiser and a funder and at Washington Women's Foundation, which is a collective giving organization, a lot of my job was fundraising to encourage women to join the foundation. And when I first joined the foundation, one of our goals was to diversify the membership because it was a predominantly white um, group of women of wealth um, who were funding mm -hmm. predominantly white led organizations. And so you know, there was the question about why do women of color not want to join our giving collective? And mm. when you really peeled back and looked at the history of the organization, you saw both internal white leadership and the funding of white led organizations, you know, beg the question, why would anyone who wasn't white join our organization? Because we're not really funding their communities or anything that they care about. So I think with Morgan's help, we started really interrogating the history of the foundation and helping um, produce education that really helped to move us from thinking about diversity as tokenism, what it means to create a culture of true inclusion and belonging um, so that we could kind of try to shift um, some of the membership demographics to be more reflective of our community. Even though Seattle is predominantly white, it is a very diverse community and Washington Women's Foundation did not reflect that. So it was very, I was very fortunate that Morgan wanted to leave those tiny humans for part of the day. And from day one, she has just been such an amazing partner in the work. And in many respects, um, a very kind and generous teacher to a middle-aged white woman. Brilliant. Thank you both for just grounding us a little bit in not only your own uh, professions and histories, but also how you came together as well and the context in which you've uh, built your relationship as the universe brought you together. Um, we're we're going to continue and dig into that some more, but we have our, our warm-up question that I want to throw at you first. Uh, so one of the things that we remind our audience listening through both the title of this interview series, It's Not Your Money, and this opening question is that when we are incorrectly labeling the money in foundations and donor advice funds as still belonging to the founders of those uh, um, entities, then we also act like the money and the foundation belong to them as well, which perpetuates the concentration of power. So in thinking about how words influence who holds power, I would love to ask you, Beth, um, what shift in language do you think we need to be making that might help diversify power and funding? I think my work um, to become um, more of a practitioner of anti-racism, especially in philanthropy, started even before Washington Women's Foundation continued on through. And then when we thought about starting threshold philanthropy with resources that my husband and I have, what we acknowledged was that they weren't even our resources to begin with. Like our family, there's generational wealth on my side, mm -hmm. um, but the result of stolen land and stolen labor. Um, my family is originally from North Carolina and has been there for many generations. Um, so we directly benefited from enslaved labor and land stolen from indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. And my husband, a first generation American, um, but he, um, he also, he, he looks like a, a white male. He's of European descent. Um, he's made a lot of money in the technology field. But again, acknowledging that you know these, his ability to achieve what he has achieved has also been a part of the institutional racism and systems in our country that elevate his chances of success over others. And so even before we put money into a family foundation or threshold philanthropy, we were acknowledging that what we had wasn't our own 
or it wasn't the results entirely of our own efforts. And so I think that people have to acknowledge first that any wealth in this country has been enabled by white supremacist structures. And until we can do that, like I think it's, you know, it's, it's even beyond mm -hmm. once you put it in a DAF or a private foundation, just acknowledging if you have it, if you are white and in this country, it's not entirely yours. It's not yours, period. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, my ancestors benefited from white capitalism, white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we view what we do at Threshold Philanthropy as a return of resources, not charity. Mm -hmm not white saviorism, not there's something to fix in the community, but the fact that we shouldn't have all these resources fundamentally and that they could be returned. Wonderful. Thank you, Beth. Um, and yeah, I think we're going to we're going to dig into that a little bit more, uh, the, the relationship with money in our conversation. So we'll we'll pick up on that thread again. Uh, Morgan, how about you? How would you answer that question? Yeah, I think the acknowledgement piece is so important acknowledgement of that all wealth is the result of harm of black and brown communities it has to be the basis i think of how we do this work i think philanthropy unrealistically gets the rep of being altruistic like people are doing philanthropy because yep. they are good people and the reality is they are only allowed to do that because they have an excess because of the harm of black and brown communities mm -hmm. and i think when we come from that spot, then we have to question why we are considered experts just because we have the money, right? Why is philanthropy being told that we are experts or we get to tell communities that we are not a part of what is risky? Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I, I think another thing that Beth and I are real big proponents of is that the community is not something separate from us that we need to fix. We do not work within communities that we are not a part of. And if we are trying to work in areas where we don't live or we haven't lived in a long time, we first make relationships and first fund intermediaries that are trusted messengers. Mm -hmm. And we build on those relationships. But I'm not going to walk into a, a community that I don't know about and tell them how I think they should do something. And so I think all of philanthropy needs to understand that the community is not something that's separate from us that we need to fix. Mm -hmm. And if we aren't being intentional about our relationships, then we should not be doing the work that we are doing. If we are not going to acknowledge where the money came from, we should not mm -hmm. be doing the work that we are doing. And I, I think that onus might be, give people pause and sit in shame and shame is not useful. It is not useful mm. for us to sit in shame around the money. You, The money is with you and it shouldn't be. Mm. So how do we move it in an intentional way? And instead, instead of getting stuck in shame or transferring that shame to communities of color who then are yeah. like, I don't, I now I feel shame about this money when their ancestors have worked for this, you know, like, yeah. so I, I want us to one, release the shame of it all and two, acknowledge it and sit in that hard conversation Beth brought, oh God, I always forget where it comes from, Beth, but Beth brought this this circle image to us around like, you know, you should, if you're learning, you should be on the edge of being uncomfortable. And when mm. we were working at the Washington Women's Foundation, that's how we we preface everything. If you are a little uncomfortable, it means you're learning. We don't want you to be so uncomfortable to where you're frozen, but communities of color have had to um be uncomfortable all of the time to understand whiteness we can be a little uncomfortable to understand those communities and i wish i could remember the name of that image sorry beth i always forget like the learning uh, edge and the growth zone yes, so you, yes. Yeah, you want to be on the learning edge and the growth zone and be uncomfortable mm -hmm. because white people have had the power to go back to our zones of comfort We've had the privilege of being able to step back anytime that we don't mm -hmm. feel comfortable. And that's a completely opposite situation of most of our black and brown colleagues. And so they're really um, pushing to be in that space to shift Absolutely. the power, the privilege. Absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you both of uh, you for taking us in this direction and uh, particularly around uh, white exits as well um and and the many off ramps <laughs> that we can find 
uh, in this conversation, and, and that kind of leads into the the um, the next question that I'd love for us to take a moment to discuss, and and that is that when we first talked about having this conversation, the topic that almost immediately came up was the topic of risk, and how the risk that each of us navigate in having conversations about race and power out in the open and in particularly in a professional environment as well um and how that the risks are very different um and so let, let's start there again today like how would you each describe the risk that white funders and fundraisers of color face when they're speaking frankly about race and power in the world of philanthropy yeah we've been having i feel like all of our conversations lately have been geared towards this um i would say there's no risk for white people like the risk for white people is being told you're racist or that you're doing it wrong um and i feel like the risk for black and brown people are death at the most extreme and at a little bit less is like getting fired right like we are putting it on the line to educate you all um and then when we are met with resistance we could get fired right like the education has to be something that white people welcome or else our lives and our livelihood is mm -hmm. on the table and that is really really wild because as me and beth have had these conversations before what we're realizing is white people's discomfort and Brittany Pacnetti wrote an article about this for the cut is like white people's discomfort is is being felt to them as fear and and their and their fight or flight response is being initiated mm -hmm. but I don't know what the fear is of because there's never actually been a harm mm -hmm. there's not actually been a harm made when you make a mistake community saying hey this isn't going well has never resulted in anything but shame. So is this mm. fear of being shamed or doing it wrong really worth the detriment that we are putting black and brown people to? Because what that is happening, it's resulting in our sector and across the board of black and brown folks dying, burning out, not being able to work. Uh, I know so many black and brown folks who are, are, are having diseases that shouldn't like who are having little surgeries that are resulting in oh the that ten percent of people get this from that and they are all getting it because in our in our systems is so much stress from navigating whiteness and white supremacy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so I I mean I told a group of people last week and I feel like I'm talking in circles because so I'm gonna stop but like there is no risk for white people and by us framing it as such, we are coddling them. Yeah. And they need to understand you are not fragile and there is no risk. Just to add on to one of your points, Morgan, I was in a workshop the other day where um, the, the presenters I was learning from were talking about statistics that had shown that the health outcomes of black women as they progressed their education to higher education decreased because they were having to navigate such deeply held white spaces and systems um and and you know there's this myth that you know black and brown people just need more education you know uh, they need to earn more money and and then health outcomes will increase this was data explicitly proving that the opposite is the case because of the 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 insipidness of the systems that they were then having to expose themselves to in order to get that further education but sorry i want to um cut in too much there beth were you gonna uh add on to that I think the only thing that I would say is this bizarre notion of perfectionism and how deeply embedded it is in philanthropy. Like philanthropy is not allowed to make mistakes. Mm. Like every single grant has to result in the perfect set of outcomes being delivered in a specific time frame. 
and there's no opportunity to innovate. There's no opportunity to be creative. And, yeah. you know, we constantly say like inventor capital, if one investment is a home run, then and a hundred are complete flukes and tank, you know, that suddenly that person who made the investment is brilliant. And philanthropy is not allowed to do that. Philanthropy has to be spot on every time. And mm -hmm. so I think we need to release that sense of perfectionism because otherwise, like, otherwise this risk conversation will continue to come up right. and it's deeply insulting to say like, it's a risk to invest in a black leader who has demonstrated leadership and outcomes for her community. That is just, that's deeply offensive. And so mm -hmm. I think both perfectionism and this discussion about risk have to be completely wiped out of the sector because clearly both are keeping us from accomplishing anything. Like philanthropy isn't working, right? Like yeah. we are still facing all the same problems that we were mm -hmm. facing generations ago. And so I think we've got to let go of both of those concepts if we have any hope of driving any real change. I think it's really interesting like, as we get to this point where there's 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 a lot of passion in the conversation, right? Just to remind everybody watching that and listening that uh, Morgan is the CEO and Beth is a funder of an organization. And so if, <laughs> this is not a typical conversation that you find most e diesel CEOs having with their funders, especially across, you know, racial differences as well. And there are a few things that really strike me as fundamentally different in the way that you both show up in your partnership for each other when compared to the norm, like the, the general practice of funders, uh, funder leaders and funder trustees or board members showing up together. Why do you think that the way you're able to show up uh, together for each other, you know, um, in, in front of others, does look and feel different from the norm? Um, well, <clears throat> I think when we were at Washington Women's Foundations, one of the first things Beth told me was, um, if, if someone does something offensive, can you please tell me? I'm always gonna think it's gonna happen mm -hmm. unless you if, unless you tell me you're it's gonna happen. And I'm like, this white woman does not want me to know when some want to know when someone does something racist. It's gonna I'm gonna be in her <laughs> office every five minutes. Um, and I feel like I tested it, and I and she even knew she was like, I know you're only telling me ten percent. And I kept testing it, mm -hmm. and to her credit, every time she would she would tell me I'm not getting fired for saying the thing. Thank you for letting me know. She never told me it wasn't real. She never told me it was in my head. She always saw it. And, and oftentimes she would apologize for not saying something in the moment. Oh, mm -hmm. And I, I, I think when we started, it, we were working as a team on this other thing. We were working to bring 400 mostly white women to the point of understanding equity. So we had the same goal and I think as often with black people i was waiting for her to to realize this goal was going to be harder and to give up yeah and not only did she not give up she was honest she was vulnerable i mean we've had our our rough spots but we i think that growing zone that learning zone we've always leaned into each other when we are in those spots versus lean away and i've i've said all of the things to Beth. I've told Beth, you're learning, the learning of that foundation was on my back. It was my, that I was, I was harmed. And mm -hmm. again, to her credit, she heard all of that. I don't, I don't know what it's like to hear that. And yeah. she heard that and accepted it. And there's, there's a chart of like when black women in the workforce and it says like, here's what happens. You hire a black woman, you're in the honeymoon phase, something racist happens. You pretend it didn't, she leaves. And I, I remember showing that chart to Beth and saying, and here's where you were different. You never told yeah. me it didn't happen. You never told me it didn't happen. And mm. I've also been in a lot of rooms and I, I mean, I'll let Beth speak for herself where people would defer to her and she would say, I don't know why you're asking me. Morgan has already said she doesn't want it. So we're not gonna do it. So she right. never undermined me in a room. She never didn't stick up for me. 
Mm -hmm. And often if she was confused or if I wasn't acting how she or out of the normal, she wouldn't assume mal malice or mad intent. She would ask me. And I think right. often in all of our relationships, we write folks off. And especially with as philanthropy, we ask nonprofits to do all the unfun things. And when it's time for the fun thing or the thing where they can actually have power, we say they're too busy. Mm. and that spent a lot of time making sure the rest of the world understood that we were equal and that she always referred to me as a colleague or a friend she never said that she was my boss yeah. she always she was always saying we are equals mm. as much as she can in a world that knows that we are not <laughs> that's that's quite incredible. And that's, uh, that's uh, I think what it strikes me in your answer, Morgan, is that everything that you mentioned must have been done consistently and repeatedly because none of those things you do it once and, and that's it, right? For the trust, for the relationship that you both have, it's a repetitive, continual process of consistency. Um, thank you. Beth, what's your theory? I think it's because Morgan saw my humanity and I saw hers. Mm -hmm. And I think that often doesn't happen in, in a workplace. Um, it's maybe a defense mechanism. You don't want to get too close to your colleagues, but to work across race and class lines, you have to be vulnerable. And that still doesn't mm -hmm. mean that like, when I needed to, to pull the boss move with some decision, like it couldn't be done, but I was also very transparent and very vulnerable in where I was struggling. Um, so I think that it's key to create a culture where everybody can be vulnerable. Everybody has, um, has the chance to lean into the work and that was one of the reasons why when we started Threshold Philanthropy, we chose an, a, a limited liability company structure, which is very mm -hmm. atypical because yeah. there is no board of directors or a board of trustees to which staff reports. It's a very mm -hmm. flat hierarchy. And we have intentionally created a culture of consensus and consensus building. It doesn't mean that harm doesn't happen. It doesn't mean that I don't have power and privilege in certain ways, but that we're acknowledging it constantly and trying to be intentional about how it shows up or doesn't show up in the work. We also, I think, unlike other funders, viewed our work in four domains as a grant maker, yes, as a civic mm -hmm. actor, for sure, but also as an investor, where every dollar, you know, whether it's paid to a vendor or whether it's invested in the market or elsewhere, like we're constantly trying to look at the work in a way that brings you know, anti-racism. How do we dismantle white supremacy with this decision? And employer. So even though I am technically Morgan's employer, it was as important. Like our work isn't just the work that we do in the external work. Our work is actually what's going on between us as individuals. And if things right. aren't, you know, going smoothly, like we pause everything external and focus on what's going on internal. Because if harm is happening inside our organization, then harm will happen outside of our organization. So it's very important that we tend to our relationships as much as we tend to our relationships with our funded partners out, outside of our walls. I couldn't agree with that more. Um, sorry, Morgan, go ahead. I was just gonna add like, again, uh, Bez is someone that I know very much to live her values, right? When we started Threshold, she she came in as again we are equals right mm. so I am not going to all she didn't come to Lindsay and I and say here's my blueprint for a foundation can you guys then lead it she said what do we want to do mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. made all of those decisions together which is rare across the board not just in yes. and and especially where for us as black women for the for a white woman to say I, I could have power, but I am going to structure this as if we are all equals, even if the world does not see us that way. And again, philanthropy pretends that we don't make the rules. 
And so then we're like, oh, I can't do this. I can't do this. You are in charge. The only rule is that you have to give away 5% if you have an endowment. That is it. So we could break barriers. We could, philanthropy could be a place where we show the government how we want to interact with each other and see each other as whole, but we have used it to perpetuate power. And so the first thing I think was different for Threshold was that Beth said, I will build the world I want to build with you all instead of I'm going to perpetuate power and ask you to react to the thing. And that is, again, something we saw at Washington Women's Foundation. Community would say, people say they want power sharing, but then they bring us something to react to versus allowing yeah. us to have a say on the ground floor. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think to, to try and make this a little bit more accessible, for folks watching because I think, I think you know there are going to be executive directors who are just like I don't have this relationship with my <laughs> uh, how 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 do I get there um and and as you mentioned Beth like you don't get it right all the time right and and you both talked about how human we're living in societies that uh reinforce values that the two of you have rejected, right? Living in societies that surround us with messages of scarcity, of stratification, of us and them, of fear. Um, and so, as you mentioned, like you, you don't get it right all the time. So can you just give us an example of what you, what might have happened in a situation where one or both of you did something that perpetuated the power imbalance? and how you worked through that moment together. Because I think that could be kind of instructive for people as they try and figure out, you know, how to address those moments where they feel the power imbalance reinforced, but aren't quite sure how to do something different so that it is actually addressed rather than just brushed under the rug. First of all, I want to make it really clear, really clear that I am far from perfect and that I live in a state of constant dissonance. Like my daughter goes to a private school. I drive a really nice car. It's not that I've wholeheartedly rejected capitalism and all the trappings right. of it. So I want to be really clear that, you know, it's, it's a constant struggle of living into those values and, and knowing that sometimes you're going to have to make incremental pro process because also systems aren't set up. Like even when we were thinking about doing a 401k or 403b plan, like the easiest solutions were through Vanguard or Philadelphia companies that invest in the private prison system in the United States. So everything that's simple, we said all easy roads lead to white supremacy, <laughs> threshold philanthropy. And so it was also knowing that some of these things were going to take a lot more time to figure out. Like if you wanted to do something quick and easy, which might also feel easy for your employees, you really have to interrogate and dig down and then agree that like this doesn't feel good to all of us. So we're going to choose to move in a different way. And to be truthful, we still built an institution. Like we are still grappling with the tax laws and legal structures that the world has given us to operate within and they cause harm they continue to cause harm we continue to rub up against that and so i think what you know that that is two years into this um pilot project you know we're we're rubbing up against some of those challenges and for uh organizations that's deeply committed to individual and collective healing, like we are finding that still harm occurs in our space. And so what can we do to address it? And so I think it's always being willing to put a pause and to do something that's radically different for philanthropy is like, we are intentionally saying, you know what, we're not gonna do that anymore. And oftentimes philanthropy refuses to say that was a mistake. Uh, we're gonna stop doing this we need to pivot and try something else. But we've been real clear to all of our funded partners too that 
we're experimenting. Nobody has written the playbook for what we're trying to do, which is to build a multicultural democracy and a liberated future that's, you know, focused on healing. And so we are going to make mistakes. We may cause harm, but we want to acknowledge when that happens and be willing to fundamentally change. Yeah, I think that even in our, our, our learning, we're acknowledging that folks are unlearning and they're unlearning at different spots. Me and Beth came from uh, one org and the other, our other colleagues came from a different org, right? So we don't know what trauma or harm they had to deal with. And I think her always, my partner always says is that when you're in relationship and in partnership, that you know you're going to meet the person whose trauma directly rubs against yours and that is just a fact right like and and i think like the thing that we are not used to when we talk about ideating across racial and class lines is that it's not that we're not looking for a world where only black and people get to black and brown people say what is hurt and what is harm so again, if I want Beth to see my humanity, I also have to see hers, right? The, the, the systems are different at play, but I have to be able to hear what she is saying. And I think even with the 401k model, right? Like when we are talking about 401ks and we are talking about private prisons, Beth knows that my father was incarcerated for 23 years. So she understands that private prisons is a no for me. I don't know if we were in a different thing and I wasn't willing to tell her that, how someone might be able to say, hey, this is a hard no for me without, and again, we want to build structures where our colleagues can say, I'm having a bad day and they don't need to feel like they need to tell us why they're having a bad day. I want that too. And if I'm walking down the street and I'm like, oh, I hate bicycles and my colleague's father was killed on a cyclist accident, if she's not willing to tell me that, then I, I don't know that I just stepped in it royally. And maybe it can't happen right then. Maybe it has to happen later. But I think sometimes when we are like, oh my God, I, I don't know why this person doesn't understand, but we're not willing to tell them what's rubbing up. And so again, it, there's this, it's this line of teetering of feeling like, I don't want people to feel like they have to show me their pain, but I do want to understand you. And so I feel like we're teetering that line always. We never want people to feel like, you know, it's like poverty porn and they have to show us all their scars. And I, I do want my colleague who's an adoptee to feel comfortable telling me, hey, this is a hard line for me. And, and when I'm in a better place, I would love to tell you why that's a hard line. And I, and I think for us, it started with, we, we've practiced a lot of different things, searching for common language so that people can say, oh, this isn't feeling right without having to go relive it. And so I think in philanthropy, we ask, we've taken on this language of like, we need to, you need to be able to be your whole self at work. I don't know if that's the right language, but what I want to do is be able to show up and say, this is what is happening today. I, there was a time at Washington Women's Foundation where I had decided I was going to show all of the women the documentary, or it wasn't documentary, When They See Us, Ava's depiction of the Central Park Five. And I, again, it was solely my decision. It is a really hard thing to watch. But before the first, fourth one, I texted Beth and I was like, hey, I'm not going to be able to come in until... I, we're going to watch this because I was in, again, this was my decision. I'm in a room full of white women watching a very grotesque, it's not grotesque, it's just hard to watch a scene of a minor being incarcerated. And I knew I was going to do that today. And I had, and I had already told Beth about my father. So she understood, hey, you're not going to be able to show up to work to write. It's a thing I wanted to do. I wanted to do this. And it was still hard. So I think, again, things can be hard. You can sit with them. You can sit with the discomfort. It doesn't mean someone doesn't want to do something just because it's hard. They just might need some more care. So I know that wasn't a direct example of a power thing, but I think what, what it's, it's hard to show our direct examples without 
showing our colleagues business and we kind of don't want to do that but we want to tell you guys that power shows up in everything it's at the water so we're consciously trying to navigate that water and you just have to be willing to hear people when they say hey it's showing up for you right now i need you to take a step back i actually think your your answers are really practically helpful for folks because you you know you're not only saying but you're demonstrating that the the difference is often between between being vulnerable and it being inappropriate is the performative aspect as well. Uh, and, and you know, I really appreciate that, you know, you, you didn't pick one specific example and you've been able to instead give us tools, language, uh, uh, examples of how to handle those types of situations because they come up for all of us as we try and navigate um, uh, where our relationships are at and how we want to push them further. Um, I, I, I want to dig in on on something you said, Morgan, uh, that, uh, that I'm going to paraphrase it wrong, I apologize, but something along the lines of the universe is going to bring you the person whose trauma rubs up against your own trauma. Uh, and a concept that you two introduced me to is uh, thinking very clearly and deliberately about the separation of the conversation about race from the conversation about money. So <laughs> this is trauma is rubbing up against each other right here. Both highly, highly charged topics to delve into especially within traditional hierarchies of philanthropy and just organizational management, right? So I would love for you to tell our audience a little bit more about what you meant and what you were describing as you were talking about separating out those topics and, and, and perhaps if you feel it's appropriate, how that happened for the two of you. Uh, <laughs> I'm feeling the trauma right now. And I think that I, hopefully this will be pretty articulate. I mean, I think what we haven't touched on yet is how, you know, in parallel with the work that we were doing at Washington Women's Foundation, I was working um, in a cohort of white women with wealth. And we were really um, on trying to get to the root of our own trauma related to money and also the trauma related to racism like I realized that um I was not I'm I'm so not woo woo I was I'm completely unattached from my body and the more I thought about it was like I feel like my ancestors were probably exposed to a lot of racial trauma that in some ways caused them to disassociate from their bodies because it was too much to bear and so I think some of my generational trauma around white supremacy and racism is this inability to feel things in my body, um, any emotions. And so I've had to work deeply to, to, you know, that is how racism has hurt me. And so I've had to really work on that. I've also had a lot of issues with money that are really about like the lessons I was taught about money as a child, you know, one of them was you don't talk about money when you're a wealthy person, you know, so there was, so the white women in our group, like we wrote our stories of money, like generational stories of money and really delved into the stories and then articulated like how money has hurt us. Like where is our money trauma? So now that we can say those things, we can work on those things. Um, but it was interesting that we thought about our race and our gender even before we talked about the money when we were intentionally coming together to talk about all of those things and their intersection and so just acknowledging like we all regardless of our skin color there's trauma related to both and being able to get in touch with that I think helped me prepare for having those conversations because I could notice when things were coming up in me and that it wasn't actually, I wasn't reacting to Morgan or to a thing that Morgan said, it was my own trauma. So then to say, okay, mm -hmm. Beth, I can hold my own trauma 
I don't have to blame Morgan for stirring up that trauma because it has nothing to do with her. It right. is all me. And so I think that helped prepare me in a way um, to have those conversations. And that doesn't feel good to say either. Like I, I'm not a victim of my trauma, but mm -hmm. I, I have to work on that trauma. Yeah. And I think I, I would say like at Washington Women's Foundation, right? Like we were doing race first, right? Like we were trying, I was the first black staff member. There was another woman of color on staff. Um, but she, she had even said to me, I don't, I don't think people see me as a woman of color. Like, and, and so that was there, it was happening. We, and, and I don't think we intentionally separated the conversations. I think it naturally happened, right? Like we were dealing with race every day. It, you know, Beth would get emails saying like, you know, I've long been a, a cheerleader of women of color and young women, but are you sure about Morgan? Should she be talking in this meeting, right? Like it was there every day. Like me being at Washington at that org stirred up like, are are people ready for the thing they think they're ready for, right? And I remember this distinct moment of being like, oh, their target audience is a 27 year old woman of color. That's me. If, if they can't handle me, they're not gonna be able to handle the thing they say they want. So I have to show up authentically as myself. And I remember going to Beth and saying, I think I'm going to do this. This is going to be backlash. People are not actually ready for a black, queer, fat woman to show up in space. And that is what I am planning on doing, right? And it's so interesting because then class stuff would come up. People were so afraid of talking about race. They would be like, we should be talking about class. And there was, and I remember like we were trying to approve like a, a, a new budget or something like that. And we didn't have quorum and I was crying. And Beth was like, they say they want to talk about class. This is class. This is a class issue, right? So even I, I, I've i told people before, like, I know you were poor once, but when was really the last time you were poor, right? So even when we were trying to do all of these race things, I was very clear that Beth had a grasp on what it actually was like not to have money. I had colleagues at other foundations who there would be a, a mess up in their system and they wouldn't get paid for a month and no one would let them know. Our bookkeeper made a mistake once and we were going to get paid on the 16th instead of the 15th. And Beth sent out an email and she said, hey, the, your pay is going to be a day late. I know this might affect you. Someone please let me know, right? Like that is someone who understands that people are living paycheck to paycheck, right? So although we weren't talking about the money stuff in that way, I think we were still bringing it up, right? Like, because we were colleagues and equals, I would talk to Beth about my student loans. Like, I wasn't the only Black person she knew, and I wasn't only showing her the perfect version of my life. So when we're talking about money in class, if the only conversation we are talking about money is, is when you guys are in the boardroom, then you're not having it, then you're only talking about your money. You're not hearing about the black and brown people's money experience. You're only hearing about how they are dealing with the fact that you have money and you don't know what to do with it, which is kind of a whiplash, right? To be in a boardroom when we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars and some people can't put food on their plates and you are trying to guide this white family through to get comfortable with spending $100,000 or on a community that you know needs it so that they can eat, it's a it's hard for black and brown folks to do that. And so it was easier when even when we were talking about race to know that Beth understood that. So again, I think we're doing a disservice on both sides when we're like, because I I know so many of my colleagues at other foundations are looking at their the family they support or their boss and they're like but do you understand like do you actually understand and I think because we're not leaning into that then it's all getting coddled right it's all getting because the thing is we can separate class from race we can talk about the fact that 
my mom made just enough money to where my class conversation is very different than my partner's. And I am, and I can sit with that. But when we're throwing race on top of it and no one is willing <laughs> to talk about race, then it's all becoming a mix. And then people are like, this feels icky and I don't know why it feels icky. I think it's race and they're only seeing the race part. They're not seeing the money part. And that's because we're so unwilling to talk about the layers of race. And so again, we didn't intentionally do that way, but when we were talking to you, I realized, I was like, oh, we totally had those two separate. And I think it was beneficial. I don't know how you feel, Beth, but I don't know what we would have done if we would have done it the opposite way. Like I knew who she was. And so when we were doing the money thing, I had already seen her humanity. So then when she wasn't acting, when she was acting like not herself, I could be like, hey, I'm interested in this. This, what's happening here for you? And then again, because we'd practiced vulnerability, she could tell me what was showing up for her. And then I can be like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. That must not feel good. I don't want you to ignore your body. Let's pause, right? Like again, we don't want to go from brown people, black and brown folks feeling so ostracized then white people feel ostracized. What we want to see is what is the medium? Like, what is the middle? What does an actual conversation look like where you can say, hey, this feels yucky. And then white people be like, hey, it's not feeling good over here. I'm feeling yucky too. Oh, okay. So we're all feeling yucky. Then why are we doing it this way? Let's try. Exactly. If no one's loving this, yeah. why don't we try something different? Yes. Yes, and that is where we're going to go. Try something different because uh, we unfortunately have to round up our conversation. And the last question that I want to put to you both is when you think about us changing the way we show up with each other, when we're, we think about changing the way white funders, fundraisers of color show up for each other as we move, hopefully, you know the the whole funding industry forwards dragging it kicking and screaming into the future uh if we could build more honest and human relationships like you were just describing morgan how do you think that then changes what things look like for communities of color i mean i think the goal is is liberation and joy and a, a, a multiracial democracy, right? Like, I, I think right now we've been centering white comfort for so long and it's still not working. So like, let's try something different. Like, let's try, what would it look like cent centering black and native communities? What would it yeah. look like if, if white people were uncomfortable? Because we're saying they're, we're just trying to censor white comfort and then people are shocked when they have to give up something because they're like hey you said this was going to be comfortable and now I have to give up something and I don't want to do it and it's like well let's try telling the truth everyone's mm -hmm. going to have to give up something right like I am the oldest no one ever told me that I wasn't going to have to share everyone said you have to share like you have a sister that she is your responsibility and I think we should be each other's responsibility Beth is my responsibility and I am hers, and that is the difference. So she carries me in every room she is in. I am there, right? Unfortunately or for, you know, for better or worse, I am there, right? But you move differently when you see each other as the re your responsibility versus a burden or a charity case. And, and, I don't, I don't want to be someone's charity case. I want to be someone's responsibility. Well, then that is what would you add? Oh. Well, I think it's, I mean, it's a, it's just a privilege, you know, to always be in the space with Morgan. It's a privilege to be in relationship. And I think that's where we have to get to be like at threshold philanthropy. We intentionally, move slowly because it's not about moving money it's about building relationships and money is just one tool to make that happen and yes mm -hmm. we want to return resources we want to do that with urgency 
and we do it in the name of liberation and of healing. And so it is important to us that we are in relationship with everyone in our lives, both internally and externally at Threshold. And I think Morgan and I did want to close with saying, you know, yeah. I think, you know, a lot of people will say like, well, what you're doing is very unique. You got to do it from the ground level up. And I, I, I think to Morgan's earlier point, like we make the rules, we have the power to change the rules. And while we look at, you know, what role philanthropy should pay and rep play in reparations and the broader conversation, we look at what we do as a return of resources and a repair of harm. You know, some people will say that's not in my grant making portfolio, but I guarantee you that harm is. And so we would like to encourage every funder on this call to look at your history, which was what we did at Washington Women's Foundation, because I can guarantee no matter what you're funding, you've perpetuated some harm in black and brown communities, whether you funded a school system that you know is mm -hmm. working for those students, whether you funded cancer research that has intentionally excluded black women from that research, you will find harm and you can make repair. It's not too late. And so we really hope that everyone will take that lens to what they've done and move it forward. Amen, Beth. Wow, yes, what a powerful note to, to end this conversation on. And I, I just want to thank both of you because this has been a very, uh, this has been a growth and a learning conversation for me as well. Um, you know, especially, you know, as a, as a person who has worked for both a funding and a fundraising organization, as a person of mixed heritage, who you know doesn't know what it's like to move through the world as a high net worth white woman, doesn't know what it's like to move through the world as a black woman CEO as well. And, and I've learned an enormous amount from both of you. So just really gratitude for what you brought to this conversation today I appreciate it deeply um viewers I hope you have enjoyed uh today's discussion as much as I did and you can check out more about what philanthropy, uh, Threshold Philanthropy is doing at their website it's thresholdphilanthropy.org uh you can continue learning alongside Beth and Morgan they have a blog where they post regularly and they have a fantastic newsletter I highly encourage you to sign up for the newsletter I'm a subscriber it's one of the very few of the like 2000 that come into my inbox that I actually open and read uh, so hopefully that is uh, a recommendation that you can believe in and finally if you are a white identifying funder who believes in advancing racial equity and racial justice you're interested in a transformative learning experience please I invite you to learn more about the capital collaborative at camelbackventures.org a couple of our most recent participants had this to say about the experience. We've come out of this cohort determined to hold each other accountable, always reflecting, acknowledging when we make mistakes and continuing to do the work each day to become an anti-racist organization and co-conspirators in the industry. End of quote. If that is something that gets exciting, it gets you excited about uh, about how you want to, to do your work, then please look us up. That is absolutely everything we have time for today. My deep thanks again to Morgan and Beth and to each of you for joining us.